On behalf of the Host Center for Buddhist Studies, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, uh, Alex Kalyanitis. Oh, After two good. years, yeah, you got it. <laughs> her name, who has been a uh, postdoc with us for two years. Uh, so please join me in welcoming this evening's speaker. <laughs> well, thank you. That is really nice, John. And I do just want to take this opportunity to. Thank you all for making my time here so wonderful. You know, when I got the acceptance letter from Irene two years ago, I could not believe my luck. I mean, I knew that the Ho Center was a place for cutting edge research, for the most advanced discussions in the field of Buddhist studies. But what I didn't realize at the time, but soon found out, was how supportive of a community this place would turn out to be. You know, you've inspired my research and made the ideal place to rethink my dissertation and to find the quiet and the concentration necessary for new writing. And more than that, you've really supported me as a, like a person. You've drawn me into hallways to talk about food or <laughs> about family, sort of brightening my day. And it's the everyday aspects of the center that I've really enjoyed, you know, those kinds of emails you'd get from Tatiana from her bus rides home with a bunch of emojis in them or <laughs> like learning, you know, the percentage, the exact percentage of Simona's latest A on her Japanese exam, you know, things like that have been really wonderful. And so thank you all for welcoming me here and for really motivating me to contribute something worthwhile to this field, the field that makes extraordinary places like this possible to exist. So I really appreciate it. What I will be presenting today comes from the book manuscript I've been working on here. And the book investigates the religious transformations in Burma from the first decades of the 19th century through the end of the final Anglo-Burmese War in 1885. My analysis looks at mainstream Buddhist developments alongside new religious expressions of minority communities who engaged the American Baptist mission to Burma, which began in 1813 and was very active throughout the century. My research also explores how religious practices change for the Americans living in Burma and how they and their interlocutors influence understandings of Buddhism back in the States. So what I'm going to attempt to do tonight is give you an overview of the project and to sketch the central argument I make in the book. But first, let me set the scene. So when Anne and Adoniram Judson arrived in Rangoon in 1813, the air hanging above the Bay of Bengal was heavy and hot. The young American couple had left Boston in the cold of February, and now they stood in the wet monsoon heat on the deck of the Georgiana, the three-masted ship that had taken them east from Madras, India to Burma. From the bow, they could see the towering golden Shwedagon Pagoda, the port city's most famous Buddhist monument, as well as a scattering of smaller golden and white shrines all along the horizon. <laughs> In this illustration, you could see the kind of ship the Judsons arrived on, as well as a kind of odd outline of Shwedagon in the middle. The Judsons had sailed all this way to evangelize for the Baptist church, and the post they established would go on to make history for being the United States' first ever overseas mission. The couple's fame would multiply as accounts of their evangelical efforts traveled to North America along new global postal routes. When the Burmese king imprisoned Adoniram in 1824 on suspicion of spying for the British, Americans in Philadelphia parlors and New York boarding houses read about Anne's desperate bribes to get her incarcerated husband food and protection. Magazines published reports of Adoniram's eventual release on the condition that he served the Burmese court as its translator in the negotiations that ended the first Anglo-Burmese war. And when Anne died shortly thereafter at the age of 36, Illustrated books ran drawings of her lonely gravesite where she would be joined months later by her daughter Maria, the Judson's second child to die in infancy in Burma. New periodicals like the Macedonian, American Baptist Magazine, hi Trent, welcome, <laughs> and the Missionary Magazine established their readerships by regularly running dramatic accounts of the Judson's sacrifices as well as their successes. They covered the first baptisms in Burma, as well as Adoniram's eventual completion of the first full Burmese translation of the Bible and his pioneering work on the first <coughs> ever Burmese English dictionary. In this engraving from around 1840, you can see Adoniram holding up the last leaf of the Burmese Bible. As celebrated as the Baptist mission was in the American press, and as appealing as Christianity turned out to be among ethnic minorities, 
The Protestant mission to the Burmese proved terribly disappointing. The number of converts from Burma's ethnic majority, the Bamar, was so small that by the 1840s, the Protestant operation had already cut the number of missionaries dedicated to them in half. However, the mission was far more successful among minorities like the Karen, a prominent ethnic group from southeastern Burma that converted at rates never approached by the Bamar. For example, in 1836, the mission recorded 729 newly baptized Karen in that year alone, whereas it had only baptized 207 Bamar in all of the 23 years it had been running at that point. If anything, it seemed as though the Bamar grew more resistant to Christian conversion efforts that their Buddhist identity grew more pronounced as their kingdom weakened under the pressure of the advancing British Empire. By the end of the final Anglo-Burmese War in 1885, Burma's last Buddhist kingdom had collapsed and the entire realm was subsumed into the British Raj. Yet even in the absence of a patron king, the Burmese continued to express themselves as a distinct Buddhist country. The continued strength of Buddhism dismayed the American missionaries. In the face of pagoda repair projects and mass reproductions of Buddhist ritual texts, the Baptist evangelists justified their persistent presence by pointing to the growing number of minority converts. The American operation was the first sustained Christian mission in the country, quickly forming more active and numerous posts than the few Catholic missionaries who had preceded it, and managing far more evangelists than later British organizations. But even with this prominent status, the Baptist mission never swept the country as it had dreamed. Adoniram Judson articulated that dream when he visited the ancient temples at Bagan. He wrote that he took a survey of the splendid pagodas and extensive ruins, but he still proclaimed that the churches of Jesus will soon supplant those idolatrous monuments, and the chanting of the devotees of Bud will die away before Christian hymns of praise. <clears throat> This never happened. Burma's Buddhist monuments were not supplanted by churches. Pali chants were not drowned out by Christian praise hymns. The number of Buddhist pagodas likely increased during the American mission. Christian congregations, however, also grew exponentially. Both Buddhists and Christians amplified their religious presence in this politically contentious period. The story of the Baptist mission to Burma is a story of conversion both failed and sweeping. The Bamar energetically resisted Christian efforts and minority communities converted in astonishing numbers. And over the course of the century, American Christianity found itself changed in Southeast Asia. Missionaries who had arrived in monishing idolatry found themselves creating tree shrines and their converts hanging multicolored Jesus paintings in their churches. As eccentric as these objects might seem, these are the kinds of religious material that turn out to be at the center of this story. To understand how Burmese Buddhists resi resisted Christianity, how minority communities baptized so many new Christians, and how Protestantism transformed into a sort of Southeast Asian religion, we must look to the sacred things that these communities used to define and transform themselves. This is the central line of argumentation for the book project that I wanted to put forth here this claim that sacred objects are key to understanding the religious changes swirling around the American mission to Burma. So what I will do then is share with you three prime examples of these objects. Examples of the religious book, the spirit shrine, and the sacred portrait. In order to show, how, show the significant work they did for different communities who are adopting foreign faiths or reasserting revered religious traditions. By focusing on these objects, I hope to shed some light on the little-known histories of religious transformation during Burma's last kingdom and early American missionary interactions with Asian religions. That is, I see my work contributing primarily to two fields, the study of Burmese Buddhism and American religious history, as John had said. Burmese Buddhist studies is still a small but growing field with new excellent works like Alicia Turner's Saving Buddhism and Eric Braun's The Birth of Insight works that reveal how Burmese leaders in the colonial period drew on Buddhist traditions to negotiate the conditions of British rule and to utilize new religious resources suited to modernizing Burma. These two recent books, like the majority of scholarship that has preceded them, focus on texts composed by the politically powerful, authors such as prominent monks and urban newspaper writers, 
And there certainly remains important work to be done with these documents, and I also draw upon them. But my analysis moves in a new direction, into the archives of the American Baptist Mission. These archives offer a previously unstudied wealth of evidence of other forms of religious activity in the country among people with less political power. They provide rare glimpses into everyday life not otherwise recorded in royal histories, monastic publications, or mainstream periodicals. The American collections have preserved an abundance of detailed accounts of cultural interactions at far-flung Baptist posts and along itinerant preaching tours, where evangelists interacted with people from a wide range of socioeconomic positions and ethnic backgrounds. Furthermore, these archives have accumulated a curious collection of material culture objects involved in these interactions. By studying the American mission then, my, able, my work is able to showcase the religious histories and things that have been largely left out of scholarship. As Burma's recent political strife has shown, the country is not just populated by people belonging to the Bamar ethnicity. It is and has long been a country where many ethnic and religious groups work, live, and interact. My book project calls attention to several prominent minority communities and the way they use religious objects and inter-ethnic networks to define difference or create solidarity. To tell stories featuring the Karen, the Kachen, the Chin, is to speak not only about historical patterns of subjugation by the Bamar and the, then the British, but also to tell of the ways communities perform and materialize distinct identities in the context of empire. This study also offers what I see as a much needed correction to previous scholarship on early American encounters with Asian religions. That scholarship has dismissed missionary interactions abroad under the assumption that missionaries were simply hostile towards non-Protestant traditions. This proves to not only be a gross oversimplification, but it also shows what else we miss when we ignore these archives. When we study them with a careful and informed sensitivity to their Asian contexts and to how they have been manipulated for American audiences, we see alternative religious expressions coming from Asian interlocutors. We discover, for example, reports featuring devout elderly women and traveling merchants explaining the Burmese theories of karma that they used very effectively to argue against Christian teachings on their God's power to forgive sin. We find that pagoda festivals and monastic funeral processions inspired these first Americans living in a Buddhist culture to pen thick descriptions of rituals in their letters back home. And we find Buddhist statues, mala beads, illustrated Pali manuscripts that ended up in missionary luggage. This evidence not only disproves arguments that cast missionaries as simply dismissive of Asian religions, but it also pushes back against influential works in the field that have argued that a Protestant consensus dominated the United States antebellum period. This scholarship has held that Protestantism reigned and that all other religious expression was used in its service. But these studies continually avoid the diversity against which the Christian consensus was defined. My analysis then explores the space between pluralism and Protestantism, a place where both the world's diversity and structures for controlling that diversity are at work. This does not mean that I only seek to call attention to another neglected community. Instead, I want to ask what non-Protestants meant for Protestant consolidations. How did sophisticated arguments about karma and nirvana and the appeal of Burma's serene meditating Buddha statues affect Protestant efforts to assert the authority of reformed Christian teachings in the expanding United States? This book project, I hope, shows how it is impossible to think about imperial Christianity without thinking about its relationships to those it sought to convert. Such relationships, we learn, were not simply determined by dominant belief systems. They were often formed and transformed through sacred objects. By attending to the materiality of religious encounter, we learn about the textured performance of religious conversion and the subtleties of religious resistance. So for the remainder of my time, I want to take you through my examples of the object of the book, the spirit shrine, and the sacred portrait. On September 7th, 1828, a group of Karen people went to the home of the American missionary George Boardman, who had recently moved into their town of Tavoy. And this map of southern Burma, oh, you can't really, this is supposed to be the world, but it doesn't matter. We're just talking about Burma. Um, so this is a map of 
southern Burma, and here's Rangoon, and Du Bois way down here in the south. So a respected lead teacher led the group carrying a special book. According to Boardman, he said, my lord, we have come from the wilderness to lay at your feet a certain book and to inquire whether it is good or bad, true or false. We, Karens, are an ignorant race of people. We have no books, no written language. We know nothing of God or his law. When this book was given us, we were charged to worship it, which we have done for 12 years. The mission in Tavoy had only been established five months earlier, so Boardman must have been curious to know what book these people had been worshiping for over a decade. It was likely a Buddhist book. However, it would have been odd for a Buddhist book to be in the possession of this lay community rather than a, in a Burmese monastery. We know nothing of its contents, the leader continued, not so much as in what language it is written. We have heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ and are persuaded that your lordship can easily settle the question and teach us the true way of becoming happy. The leader then opened a large basket and proceeded to unwrap layer after layer of coverings until he finally unveiled what Boardman instantly recognized as an old tattered duodecimo volume of the Book of Common Prayer with the Psalms published at Oxford, a printed English text that would have looked something like this. Boardman said, it's a good book, but it is not good to worship it. They must worship the God it reveals. The leader, who in Boardman's words had the air of a kind of sorcerer, seemed disappointed at the thought that he had obtained no claim to heaven by worshiping the book so many years. In other words, this Quran elder understood this practice to be extraordinarily powerful in and of itself, independent of the particular teachings the book recorded. This re reorienting encounter with a special book speaks to a larger history of religious practice in this period. After American missionaries started evangelizing in 1813, Christian texts began to manifest in unexpected places. And simultaneously, the production and dissemination of Buddhist scripture became more elaborate. For example, in 1868, the Burmese king Min Don commissioned the world's largest book. It's in the form of the entire Polytopitica inscribed on 729 marble slabs, with each slab standing five feet tall, three feet wide, and five inches thick, crowned with a precious gem and installed in its own shrine. In the midst of Burma's monumental fascination with books, American missionaries sought permission to proselytize in the country by gifting Burmese monarchs multi-volume Bibles that they had gilded and wrapped in luxurious fabrics. <clears throat> In addition to mimicking local practices, the Baptists also brought new book practices, namely the printing press, which they introduced in 1816, along with original scripts for Burma's previously unlettered minority groups. After blanketing the countryside with printed vernacular arguments for Christian conversion, missionaries would return to find that while some had read and debated their theology, others had refashioned the paper tracks into wearable amulets, or wrap them in decorative cloth and string bells to be worshipped as magical devices. What I'd like to argue here is that the object of the book is central to this early period of contact, contestation, and conversion. By understanding the work books did at the outset of the Baptist mission and in the throes of the Anglo-Burmese wars, we can begin to see the larger importance of religious objects in 19th century Burma. And while missionary accounts try to humorously dismiss ritually wrapped and worshipped Protestant texts as the odd antics of confused heathens, we can read between their lines to learn more about widespread practices found among Burmese, Baptist, and other minority communities. As I show in my larger project, the final Burmese kingdom, the Kambang dynasty, used Buddhist book practices to materialize meaningful connections to ancient Buddhist sanghas and to ritually draw minority groups into its dominion. Some minorities resisted Burmese textual incorporation by engaging with Christian text instead. By accepting these non-Buddhist objects and treating them as tools of liberation, both worldly and otherworldly, these groups asserted an independence from the Burmese and a new kind of religious identity. While there is much to be learned by studying the words in these books and the ideas that they point to, <coughs> I would like to wager that there is even more to be gained by attending to the materiality of the texts and the particular forms of interaction that they animated or obstructed. To understand how the Quran elder had used an elaborately co packaged copy of the Book of Common Prayer, we must consider the contemporary use of other elaborately packaged books. So let me just give you a few examples. Oh, no. 
don't look at that yet. Okay, a few years after Boardman encountered the, the magical Karen book, a similar episode was described in the journal of Francis Mason. His 1835 story features a sorcerer-like figure from Tavoy who wielded a book he and his followers believed to be divine. Mason described this figure as a prophet who sat reclining in an elevated suite between two rows of peacock feathers. The proof the local people gave that he was a man sent by God was that he possessed a special book from heaven and they asked Mason to read it for them. Mason explains that with some reluctance, the prophet produced a small piece of wood about two inches long, one and a half broad with a short handle and wrapped in several la layers of tinsel that made a jingling whenever it was handled. On removing the tinsel, in a hollow cut in the wood were several folds of cloth, under which appeared the book spread out at full length, which Mason read as follows. Wheelwright, Winter, and Brooker, London. The worship book turned out to be a business card from a London firm. <laughs> like Boardman, Mason makes a kind of joke out of the fact that unlettered people had been worshiping rather mundane productions of the English text, of the English press. Both of their jester-like characters slowly remove the worshipped objects from gaudy layers of material, building suspense, only to arrive at the same punchline. These primitive people were idolizing ordinary texts. But we can hear behind these jokes an uneasiness about missionary methods. As American Baptists traveled from town to town where people asked for tract after tract, missionaries would occasionally express concern that the recipients would not treat their offerings with the appropriate sobriety. For example, the missionary Thomas Simmons wrote of a group of young Muslims in Burma who had made ornaments in their ears from <clears throat> tracts. And when they requested more missionary books, he concluded that they, quote, wanted a fresh supply for the same purpose, so he refused. The same missionary also recorded an encounter he had with two men who he said were cutting up our books for ear ornaments. One pair of cylinders had already been made and were worn, and another pair were under the operation of the knife. So I'm sure for you scholars of Buddhism and other traditions in Asia and other religions, these examples of communities wearing or worshiping texts that few people can read for protection in this life, for improved lots in future lives, or to revere their leaders, call to mind similar Asian book practices. In this particular Burmese context, where the majority of people are affiliated with the Theravada Buddhist lineage, Pali manuscripts, recording what the monastic establishment and its royal patrons hold to be the very teachings of the Buddha himself, were treated as sacred objects that not only preserve, preserve the Dharma, but that could also perform magical acts. So the most treasured of Buddhist texts in this period is a book containing monastic ritual formulas known as the Kamavacha in Pali, or the Kamawa in Burmese. This text is written in a special script known as Tamarind Seed Script that is used almost exclusively for this type of book and one that most people cannot read. In the 18th and 19th centuries, these hand-painted manuscripts were created with precious substances such as pearl, ivory, and gold. They were also made using sections of monastic and royal robes and cremation ashes. Burmese kamawas were illustrated and enclosed with bejeweled cover boards and decorated binding ribbons. They were stored in ornamented bookcases, only taken out for special monastic ceremonies such as higher ordination, upasampada, or the donation of robes, katina. Handcrafted, mass-copied kamawas coursed through Burma more robustly than any other Buddhist book in this pre-British period. In my larger project, I examine over three dozen Burmese kamawa, published and unpublished from Burmese and international collections, dating from the 17th through the 19th centuries, to understand what their material and visual components re reveal about Buddhist practice in Burma's last kingdom. I have found that while the words themselves do not change, the illustrations transform to feature a new soldier-like figure. Earlier design motifs showcasing Buddhas, flowers, and stupas give way to these sword-bearing spirit lords. I argue that this visual materialization of Burma's most beautiful book reflects a larger effort of the Kambang court to use Buddhist ritual practices and powerful objects to fortify a kingdom at war with the British and threatened by ethnic divisions. This highlights the significant role religious books played in the transformations of this period. 
we know that Americans were familiar with these, this important Burmese book tradition because they even ended up acquiring their own copies, including this gold lacquered kamoa donated to Brown University in 1881 by the Baptist missionary Josiah Nelson Cushing. And this kamoa, which was taken from the royal chest of Burma's last king, Tiba, by Marilla Baker Ingalls, a missionary in Burma from 1851 through 1902. It seems that missionaries were so familiar with Burmese Buddhist book practices and with a particular style of adornment unique to the Kamala that on the rare occasions they had to meet with reigning monarchs and present them with Bibles, they took special measures to have their holy books prepared in a similar fashion. This was the case the first time an American went to a Burmese palace. It was 1820 at the beginning of the reign of King Bajida and Adoniram Judson traveled to the royal city of Ava. All who came to visit the king came bearing gifts and Judson was overwhelmed by the question of what to offer. He wrote in his journal that he wanted there to be a congruity between the present and their character and so that the Baptist decided to give the Bible in six volumes covered with gold leaf and what he described as Burman style, each volume enclosed in a rich wrapper. Along with the Bible, Judson presented a petition to the king requesting permission to preach Christianity. Mao Zha, a chief minister, unwrapped the Bible while the king remained quiet. Breaking the silence, Mao Zha spoke for the court, saying, Why do you ask for such permission? Have not the Portuguese, the English, the Muslims, and people of all other religions full liberty to practice and worship according to their own customs? In regard to the objects of your petition, His Majesty gives no order. In regard to your sacred books, His Majesty has no use for them. Take them away. This 1862 illustration of the event shows Judson and his colleague James Coleman in the foreground next to the luxuriously encased volumes of the Bible. I think you'll agree the Burmese king is drawn to look rather menacing. He holds the petition in one hand and his other hand grips a sword. And then you have this line of devotees prostrate before him. This image conveys a sense that the missionaries often expressed the sense that they had made great efforts to work with Burmese authorities, but the Burmese were too devoted to Buddhism to give Christianity a second thought. However, we could also read the Judson Bajida exchange as suggesting that if the king had accepted this impressive Christian object and allowed it to occupy space in the royal court, he would have granted it more power. Therefore, by exiling the foreign texts from the palace, the monarch was diluting their potency. Seen in this way, this story illustrates the importance of the materiality of books, as well as the importance of their possession and circulation. The Burmese had such strong Buddhist textual traditions that all in all, the Baptists and their books seemed to be seen as mild threats or amusing curiosities. But not so for minority communities, many of whom had a long history of being denied access to Burmese monasteries, and therefore to literacy training and powerful Buddhist books. Many of these communities were quite taken with the evangelical Americans and their seemingly inexhaustible gifts of religious texts. It's important to clarify that these convert communities did not just adopt the book practices prescribed by the Americans or take their Bibles and give them some kind of Buddhist flair. They also creatively renegotiated ritual ways of engaging Protestant texts. A good example of this will take us into our next section on the spirit shrine. So this is the decorated banyan tree that the missionary Marilla Baker Ingalls had on her land in Tonza, a town 100 kilometers north of Rangoon. The tree had been considered the abode of gnats, or local spirits, long before Ingalls and her community converted it, converted it into a Christian shrine, covered with illustrations of biblical scenes, scripture quotations, photographs of Queen Victoria. Sorry, it's not a great photograph, but that's Queen Victoria there. And even American medicinal advertisements like this ad for Perry Davis's vegetable painkiller. So as you can see in this 1897 photo, visitors would gather at the base of the tree to pay homage to the powerful prints and the immaterial power they represented. This Burmese community also took an interest in the cast iron dog Ingalls kept on her land. Ingalls said that she kept the life-size canine chained, chained to the edge of the property as a prop for teaching about the powerlessness of idols. 
She would ask people to examine her dog, which she said might seem impressive from a distance, but was actually powerless to protect the property since it could not chase away thieves or sound alarming barks. Likewise, she argued, Buddha statues were powerless to help those who worshipped them. What is interesting, though, about the accounts we have of Ingalls' dog is that it seems to have become a kind of sacred shrine in its own right, with local people coming to give offerings of food and respect. Rather than working to turn people away from image worship, Ingalls' dog was transformed into a shrine resembling others in the country. The people of Tonzo took Ingalls' Christian materials and reworked them into Southeast Asian style religious objects. And what is particularly remarkable about Ingalls' missionary career beyond the fact that she worked as a rare, independent female missionary in this far-flung post. But beyond that is that she claimed the most Bamar Buddhist converts to Christianity, including the conversion of 100 Buddhist monks, or this is sort of according to the reports. It seems that her spirit tree and her dog shrine were able to inspire more baptisms among the majority population than any other mission station in the country. In other words, the materiality of these shrines, like the materiality of religious books, work to form new congregations and to bolster divisions between communities. <coughs> so now for the last part, I just want to take you to 21st century Burma to show you how communities there continue to creatively and strategically mobilize religious materials to define themselves. In 2013, Thousands of Christians from around the world and within the country gathered in Rangoon, now known as Yangon, to com commemorate the anniversary of the arrival of the Judsons. In January of that year, I traveled to Burma with the American Baptist Historical Society on their Judson 200 legacy tour and learned how sacred objects continue to define religious identity in the country. The most unexpected object I encountered turned out to be a painting or more accurately, a set of portraits of Judson and Jesus. It was as though everywhere I looked in Burma, I found these particular Christian faces. For example, on our first Sunday, we visited the country's oldest Baptist church, where this huge oil painted banner hung behind the center stage, and it featured the Judsons. And above hung a spotlighted version of Varner Salman's Head of Christ. This was just the first of many encounters we had with nearly identical paintings. It's perhaps not surprising that I saw so many depictions of the Judsons. It was their bicentennial after all, and local churches, national organizations, and American religious groups had put a lot of energy and resources into materials commemorating the event. As for the many prints of Solomon's Head of Christ, that image is found all over the Protestant map. In fact, the 1940 painting by the Chicago artist is the most popular religious image in the world, with over 500 million copies produced by the turn of the 21st century. But American Baptists tend to hang their Solomon prints in their homes or their church halls, not on their altars. So I found myself wondering why Christians in Burma gave such prime church real estate to images of Jesus with golden highlights and angular facial features. Oh, here, I'll take you back. Did you see this already? Yeah, no. Here you go. Um, and there seems something curious about the Judson images, too. Instead of portraying the couple as dressed for evangelizing the Southeast Asian country, the Judson paintings consistently costumed them in the stately fashions of early 19th century America. Why did these portraits not show Anne in the thin, bright local fabrics she had adopted or add an arum in the simple <coughs> cotton clothes that he had chosen for this warm climate. Why remember the founding missionaries in the heavy materials, ornate necklines, and muted, muted colors that they might have worn to sit for formal portraits in New England? What does it mean that this country's Baptist congregations gaze up at all of this exoticized religious imagery? The answers to these questions could go in two rather different directions. We could say that the Anglo-American style of this country's church paintings reflects a lasting influence of Western imperialism. Or we could say that Christians in Burma use these images to set themselves apart from the Burmese Buddhist majority and celebrate the powerful internationalism of their church. I think that the best answer brings both of these points together and shows that the Anglo-American style of Jesus and Judson imagery does reveal a Baptist strategy to mark themselves as distinct from Burmese Buddhists 
and networked with Western countries. This strategy, though, must be understood as descending from the collision and co-mingling of 19th century empires in Burma, British, American, and Burmese, as well as coming from efforts among the country's minority communities to negotiate changing power dynamics. Here is a painting that I think works particularly well to illustrate this. It's a nine by four foot wall mural from the foyer in the main meeting space of the Myanmar Baptist Convention headquarters in Yangon, and it depicts the Judsons arriving. In this brightly colored scene, Adoniram and Anne gaze out from their ship's railing to examine Burma's Buddhist horizon. A towering Shwedagon pagoda sits on a hill in the upper left portion of the mural, and many other pagodas rise up alongside it. The spires of these religious monuments nearly piercing the painting's top border. The glistening golden hues of the Buddhist shrines curiously match the hair atop Anne and Adoniram's head, which you can see down here. While it is certainly exceptional to find the Judsons depicted as blondes, Anne's big white ruffled collar and Adoniram's formal jacket and shirt resemble the stately costumes they consistently wear in their portraits in this country's Baptist churches assuring us that these Western-dressed figures are indeed the famous founding missionaries. We viewers look out from behind them so that we can only see their backs and the sides of their faces. This angle puts the focus on the generically foreign cut of their clothes and exotic hair color. Here we find evidence that the Judsons are iconic enough among Burma's Baptists that they are recognizable by their silhouettes alone. This rear perspective also encourages the viewer to imagine the country that the Judsons first saw in 1813, an overwhelmingly Buddhist nation about to be introduced to the teachings of the Baptist faith. And as we viewers are invited into their boat, we are incorporated into their missionary project, following them to the land where they tried to turn people away from the glistening pagodas. The visual confrontation in this image between Western Christianity and Burmese Buddhism simplifies a story whose complexity lies in the diverse ethnic communities merely hinted at by the stick figures on the boats and the shore between the American Baptists and the towering Theravada pagodas. The success of this evangelical mission would be decided in large part by the minority communities who energized the 19th century mission and who sustained the Baptist church beyond the Anglo-Burmese period, Anglo-Burmese war period. These people do not appear within the frame of this wall mural, but they are the ones doing the framing. The si final set of images, I, to I told you, Adina, I keep it to 6.45. All right, so the final set of images I want to show you this evening comes from the area around Ann Judson's gravesite in Kyai Kami. This gravesite features, oh, this is down, it was called Amherst in the what period down here. This gravesite features a few memorial stones and a small church. When our Baptist tour group visited, its altar displayed a single image, a print of Solomon's Head of Christ. Behind a glistening layer of protective plastic wrap, we can make out the iconic benevolent glow of Solomon's Jesus, the highlights in his light brown hair and his thick beard. Opposite this central image hung a pair of portraits featuring Adoniram and Anne. Their faces, like the face of Jesus they look out at, are depicted in warm tones and hold soft, maybe even humble expressions. They are distinctly Western figures that seem to suggest to visitors, as well as to the mostly Buddhist and Muslim children who attend school there, that Burma's, that Burma's Baptists have a distinct but friendly international faith. Near Anne's grave site on National Highway 8, our tour passed a construction site for a colossal Buddha you can see him here in Bhumisparsha of Mudra, you know, the earth-touching posture, his most common gesture in Burma. A couple hours later, we drove through Mudon, home to the world's largest reclining Buddha, measuring over 500 feet long and nearly 100 feet high. Mudon's massive statue is certainly unique, but our encounter with it was part of a larger pattern, a pattern in which we pass by very prominent and public Buddhist monuments on our way to see Baptist sites and their westernized Judson and Jesus portraiture. Buddhist and Christian imagery was constantly brought together on our pilgrimage. The religious landscape showed sacred objects to be the modes and the methods, the contours and concerns of religious distinction, contestation, and correlation in post-imperial Burma. 
towering golden pagodas, colossal Buddha statues, and countless shrines impressed upon us the monumental power of Buddhism in the country and reminding us how in its shadow the 19th century mission carved out a place for the Baptist church. In a country that has in the last two centuries suffered the collapse of the once powerful Burmese empire, the British occupation, and failed democratic, socialist, and military governments, ethnic and religious minorities today seem to find appeal in an exoticized Christian visual and material culture. Through Protestant art objects, Burma's Baptists remember celebrated pasts and claim present day space in the Buddhist country. The limits and extent of this space continue to be shaped by the Buddhist state and Western, and Christ Western Christian donors. But as their paintings of Jesus and the Judsons show, Baptists are working within this contouring to define themselves. And Buddhists too continue to use religious objects such as new giant Buddhas and ancient pagodas to insist on the greatness of their country's Buddhist heritage. In present day Burma, Baptist Christianity has become the most popular religion outside of Buddhism. And ethnic and religious differences continue to divide the country. And as those of you um, who are familiar with the persecution of the Rohingya know, the under to understand, um, so as you guys know, and so what I'm saying that to understand these current divisions and the ones that preceded them, we should not just look to rivaling faiths. Rather, we should also consider how materials, objects both possessed and denied, form the very structures that define and divide communities. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Easy ones first, though. Could you tell, uh, talk more about the, uh, the people who are associated with the uh, tree shrine? Could you talk more about their uh, knowledge of Christian doctrines? Yeah. You mentioned that they were against idol of tree shrine. What, what else did they have? Yeah, so it's actually quite interesting. Some of the reports we have, of, uh, I'll bring you back to this tree shine. So, so what happened was, so she, Marilla Baker Ingalls had there was a blind old, she tells this story where there's this blind old monk who had a monastery there and no one really was, there wasn't much activity at the monastery and she became friends with him and she was very uh, fluent in Burmese and also had some poly chants in her pocket that she could use to impress people. And he actually became quite taken with her that when he died he donated his land to her. So she inherited this banyan tree that was before that a, nat, a, a tree for like local spirits. Well, then what she did is started putting up all these prints on the tree. And in the reports, you have people that say, oh, I, I, would, I just wanted to come to see the images, or I heard that there's a guy who died and came back from the dead, and they would start and they would want to see these images. Or they would also be curious to know about this Perry Davis vegetable painkiller. It was actually a very important tool that the missionaries had. It was an opiate, like alcohol combined. You know, so people would come to get their drugs or to look at some pictures. And she would then, you know, sort of use these occasions to start telling them stories. The thing that's hard about the records that we have of this particular shrine, most of them are from converts who say, I first came just looking to get some vegetable, you know, some painkiller, or I came to look at these images. But then I started learning about that this was, you know, that this was really true, that these teachings had a real teaching, that this, this great gnat, you know, Jesus Christ, this great spirit, really could do these wonderful things. So I think, in a way, it's, it's interesting because it sort of talks about how people came for different reasons. You know, it was kind of maybe more of like a spectacle, in a way, and then became a place where a sort of religious debate was happening. And some, you know, she said some people wouldn't believe her at all. You know, she said a lot of people came and were like, this is nonsense. This isn't a proper gnat tree. You know, you should go down the street and go put your offering somewhere else. So there was some debate there, but it seems that some people really were so taken with the kind of activity that was happening on her property that they converted to Christianity and joined this community. Yes, Simona. Uh, can you say something more about the worship of Ingold's dog? <laughs> um, if you know anything, if you know something else about it, if, were they doing that as a protest against their criticism to, you know, Buddhist icons, or did they find something appealing about this dog? Well, it's hard, you know, because you know those of you who are familiar with sort of this part of the world. Dogs aren't like a very, po you know, it's not like America where people are dog crazy. I mean, the dogs are kind of like a gross creature. So the fact that she had this cast iron dog that she got from her friends 
in New York and put it there. I think it was just something kind of odd. And in a way, you know, people said, so what, what would happen was in some of the journal entries she has, she talks about how frustrated she got because people came and kept bringing trays of food and meat and like flowers and putting them there. And she was saying, what are these people doing? And, and then she would, then when she, in her published writings, she would say, oh, these people are so ignorant. They don't even know that this isn't a real dog. But of course they knew this wasn't a real dog, you know? So she kind of, there's a, a different voice she uses to communicate to audience back home. But when she's writing more personal things and when we read even the published accounts, we can kind of look through them and say, oh, something else is going on here. It's not just people being confused and thinking it's a real dog. It's people seeing this as some kind of shrine. You know? And I think also what happened in this area, there were other shrines. You know? So I, you, know, you can imagine people with their offerings going off for the day maybe to the local pagoda and seeing, oh, that look, you know, other people have put stuff there. You know, may as well you know, cash in on the, you know, putting an offering. So it's a little hard to tell because the records are somewhat limited. But it is strange that it's a, a dog. Yeah, well. Can you maybe uh, talk a little bit more about? Uh, I suppose like the challenge of trying to figure out what is being like what the audience uh, is when you're reading these sources. I mean, I guess you have private journals and also like, public consumption. But like, what? How much of the story is shaped by the need to like sell it back to donors and sponsors back in the states? Yeah, that's a really good question. A lot. It depends on what you're reading, and definitely when you know those missionary magazine articles, especially as the mission goes on and gets into the Civil War period, where there seems to be less money. You know, they would really have to sell the idea that, you know, these people love, are really learning about Christ. But some of the earlier writings where these people are being really honest about saying, you know, no one's really listening to us. They are arguing. You know, and they're trying to work out the arguments, too. They're like, this is what they say. We say God can forgive sin. And they're like, no, you don't understand things that you've done. And they sort of, and so you, in, even in these reports where they, you know, sometimes they'll use direct quotations, but they're trans, you know. But still, they're trying to work out these kinds of sophisticated arguments. So part of what I think is the sort of methodology, the challenge, but also what I think is kind of the fun part of working these materials through is to say, OK, where is this really manipulated? And where can we actually hear you know, sort of contrary voices and arguments against? Where can we find those in there? And you know, rather than just dismiss it all and say, oh, these have been so manipulated, there's nothing real happening, I think we can actually go through and find some interesting you know, pieces of cultural life that was happening. And especially when you get into some of these you know, particular practices that you recognize, like people making offerings of food or people describing you know, sort of Abhidhamma ideas of nirvana or something like that, and you can find it there. Yes. I was really interested in uh, your attempt to not only think about the Burmese context, but also to think about trying to find a space between these binaries of like Protestant triumphalism and pluralism in until era America. And I was wondering if you just talk more about like how you're trying to find this space in between. Yeah, I think that's something that I've been. It's it's a hard thing to do because I think what people wanted to do are sort of like a more 90s multi culty kind of style of saying like let's talk about everyone, the diversity of the world, you know. And people are saying well. That's partially true, but really you have these evangelists who are going around trying to convert people and making them conform, you know. So really the story is about those Protestantism and this idea of trying to celebrate everyone, you know, holding hands was really sort of this Protestant imagination of how they kept a world going in which a lot of different cultures could exist, but theirs was the best, you know. And so I think scholarship has tended toward the emphasis on the imperial part of Christianity and on the sort of dominance of Protestant consensus. And while I appreciate that, I think it really does ignore what else is going on. You know, How can we talk about all this Protestant consensus without talking about all the other things that are happening? So it's kind of this awkward space because, again, it's kind of like this question of how do you, it's sort of like even the methodology of trying to read this material because you're still reading with these people. I mean, the American, when I look in the American archives and try and compare them to material I have in the Burmese archives, the American archives are huge. They wrote everything. They recorded everything. It really dominates even just the, the data that I have, you know? And so it's, it's a hard thing to do, but I think it's worth doing because I think there are interesting stories there that people haven't been telling. And it kind of helps to kind of make us rethink what was going on. You know, it's not like you know, since you're writing your exams, it's not like the first time people hear about Buddhism is the World's Parliament of Religion in 1893, you know? So what's happening and why were the Burmese so interested in circulating this idea that they had? Like they were really interested in saying, we have the best Buddhism. 
you, those Tibetans with all of their arms, you know, the, the Sri Lankans have got basically gone Hindu. We have the best. You know, they're like making these arguments about why their Buddhism is the best. And they're using these Protestant networks to circulate it. And I think that's interesting how these kinds of ideas end up coming back into the states. And, you know, it's hard to tell what ends up happening eventually to those ideas, but to at least try and track how they get passed down. What is, how is it that Emily Judson, the third wife of Adoniram, tries, you know, when she's really working on her Burmese in the beginning, she's working with this Buddhist monk. She gets so interested in the stories of the Jatakas, she almost gives up on this and starts translating that, you know. So how do those little interactions affect the way these people understood Buddhism and communicated Buddhism back in the States? So that was a really long answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, Trent. Uh, forgive me if I, if I missed this in, in the beginning. Um, I'm curious about how you articulate the relationship between the Bamar Buddhists and perhaps other Buddhists like Bamar um, and non-Buddhist ethnic minority groups. And I have two questions in that sphere. Uh, one is uh, with regards to some of James Scott's work um, mm -hmm. and the idea that some uh, upland uh, groups in Southeast Asia, non-Buddhist minority groups in Southeast Asia regard themselves as post-literate, in other words, have a myth about themselves that in the past they had literacy, but they, they lost it or they gave it away mm -hmm. or it was stolen. Um, and how that, whether that at all applies in, in the context of some of the groups in Burma. Um, and then secondly, what, what's, what, what is the nature of the evidence for Burma exclusion of uh, non burma non-Buddhist others into Buddhist spaces, such as Buddhist monasticism, where, what is the nature of evidence? Yeah, those are really great questions. So a lot of this material that I've been working on comes from early reports <coughs> of um, encounters with these different groups, especially the Quran. And so like, like James Scott's argument about um, you know, the sort of prophets and these ideas of these, these groups, what's interesting about the Quran, um, and this is in the, in the book manuscript, is they have this story of their this legend of their lost book. And so they say, well, we were, we were literate once. We were a great people once, but then we lost, we had this book with this really the sacred teachings in it, and we lost it. Now, by the end of the 19th century, that story, the version of that story is, we were a great people, we had language, we lost it, we lost literacy, um, but we always had this legend that it would be returned to us by this white brother and that white brother was Adoniram Judson. He came with the Bible. So it's not like we're taking your new Bible. We've always had this connection to Christianity. So in a way, they creatively rene renegotiate that. But the earliest reports that we have, so from the 1820s and 1830s, the, the versions of that, sort of the oral history records that we have, are really much more, you know, they, there's a book, and then there's a foreigner, or a kala, like the person who's gonna return it is vague, and so it's interesting how that transforms over. And I do think this question of how people saw themselves as distinct groups is really interesting, because one thing I can't quite get at, but I suspect, is that a lot of the actual linguistic work that missionaries were doing to say, okay, what is your language? How do we write it? How do we do this? Helped to form these kinds of distinct identities. And we do have, so for example, there is like this folk song that the Quran have where they talk about how they were excluded for Burmese monasteries. So it's a lot of in their own histories of the way they talk about being excluded that then they say we were excluded and then, you know, so we've been left out. What's harder to find, and if you have advice about where to go for this kind of stuff, Trent, please tell me, because you go through some of these royal chronicles or other things, and there's so little mention. Sometimes they talk about certain groups, you know, but there's really so little mention of these groups, so it's hard to know exactly how, you know, how these sort of ideas of discrete ethnic identities were, except for like with the Mon, you know, there's certain bigger groups, but some of these other groups it's harder to find except for within the groups themselves as in their relationship with the missionaries. Yeah. Yes, Paul. Yeah, so just you know, relating to that issue, um, do you think or is there any evidence for the success of the Baptists amongst the minorities being a factor in their lack of success amongst the Ramah? Yes. So I think that's a really good question. I think, and you, especially the missionaries in the mid-20th century, 
really bemoaned, in some ways it was great for their numbers because people in the states were looking for numbers. It was kind of like Stanford you know, administration, like they wanted these numbers. But then, especially Adoniram Judson and a lot of the missionaries who had come and spent a lot of time trying to learn and learning Burmese and Pali and all these things and really respecting this culture, when they became associated, the more they became associated with these minority groups, they seemed to sort of, you know, their status was diminished. And so they tried to compartmentalize the mission where they assigned certain missionaries to certain groups and then had kind of their best or their sort of most sort of linguistically talented or, you know, politically savvy missionaries continued to work with the Bamar and still, and they needed to have good relationships with, you know, people in, in positions of power. But it was a concern. And I, I suspect that over the course of the mission, and they talk about this too, the, they finally end up at a certain point almost giving up. I mean, the numbers to the majority group go so far down that they just, you know, and the demands with, they got really involved in schools for the local Eurasian and British population in the later period. So the demands just got so busy that they basically at the end kind of gave up. And even when I was in Burma um, the last two times, you know, talking to some of these people, they still were like, how do we get the Burmese Buddhists to convert? You know, what are we going to do? And the group that's had the most success are the Pentecostals, the Assemblies of God. Have, I don't know, they're very, they're becoming more popular in the cities. And so I met with some of their charismatic leaders and you know, they, they had arguments saying that really that, you know, you do need Burmese leaders to convert Burmese Buddhists and that, you know, the sort of foreignness of it all was a problem. And even the, you know, the, the Baptists kind of contributed to some of this prejudice. Like in the, one of the earliest tr um, tracts that Adoniram Judson wrote, he was saying, like, don't you know that the Buddha is, a, like, is an Indian guy? Like, why would you be worshiping an Indian? You know, he was sort of fueling these, these problems. And so by sort of, you know, really contributing to some of this sort of inter-ethnic conflict, you know, I think they kind of put themselves in a, a corner in a way. So your answer really just leads me into another question. Please. Right, which is Solomon's portrait of Christ. Mm. And in, in other contexts, like Korea, you have pretty soon a sort of indigenizing outward, right? Mm -hmm. But from what I can tell from your presentation, that isn't there in Burma. Well, it's interesting. They do do some things. Let me see if I... Well, we could see in one of the... Uh... So right, so the idea of indigenizing or this idea of mimesis, what's happening, when are they you know, sort of mimicking and changing and going. And in some ways it looks like if anything, they're further exoticizing them, right? That's sort of my argument, that they're not just sort of depicting them as they might listen. For those of you who are in my colloquium, we're looking at pictures of them in a Burmese prison cell. That was very different from some of these images. So in a way, they're kind of doing the opposite. But we do see some interesting things. For example, this isn't exactly Solomon's head of Christ. He's looking the opposite way, right? Yeah, yeah. He's also wearing a kind of red robe, which you wonder is the color of you know, the, the Buddhist monks. What are they doing there? I don't know if it's intentional. It's hard to tell like, where these things come from. But to go from this sort of gold and white to this sort of red and have them looking the other way, you just wonder, is that, you know, how do these things happen? I, I tried to interview people and talk to people about these, like why they had you know, people that had them in their homes or, you know, why. So it's hard to, like, get at that, you know. I'm trying to really, in the project, let the objects tell their own stories. But still, you're like, why do you guys have this? One guy told me, uh, <laughs> this guy who's a really great historian of the Chin, and he lives in Rangoon, and he had a Salman in, in it. So I went to interview him, and he had a Warner Salman in his home. And I was like, oh, great. Like, now you're going to tell me, like, why do you have this? He's like, oh, they make us give annual donations to the church, and then they just send us these things, and they tell us, like, to hang them up. So, you know, it's like, what's, what are, is it, you know, was he really displaying it? Like, look at me, I'm not a Burmese Buddhist, or was he just told to do, you know? So it's hard to know on sort of the individual level how these things circulate. Because it raises questions about um, Buddhist image practices, mm -hmm. and, you know, with, with photographs of famous teachers and so on, I mean, very common as well. And I wonder whether there's some kind of interplay. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to yeah, to think more about. I mean, I think in some in some respects where they do these, they'll do these displays that also you saw with the colloquium, these sort of displays that look like some of these Hell Park displays, or you know, there's some there's some exchange, but it is harder to trace that, you know, to show exactly. And also there was a woman 
who ran a stall in this bazaar, this famous bazaar in Yangon. And she, and I found in her bazaar that she had all of these images and it was like, she had like Kali, she had images for the Quran, and she had Solomon's Christ, you know. And she was just like, I serve all the others, you know. It was just kind of like they all, you know, and she, they were in a lot of this beadwork. I don't think I have examples of that. But, um, you know, this idea that there's, that they all sort of belong together in some way as a kind of collection of others, I think is pretty interesting. Can I ask you about that one too? Do you, do you know David Morgan's book on visual piety? Yes. Because there he's, he's working with that same image. Yes. And people are seeing a, you know, American Protestants see a real presence in it. The, the one I remember is the comment that, that hidden in that image is the, the host and the, like the grail, the, the you drink the wine. Oh, the yeah. Wine. Oops, I always see that now. I see how on the left, that's supposed to be like a cup that you drink the wine out Oops, of. Oops, sorry. On the left of his face in the light. Yeah, on the right fire. is the circle that's the host. So these Protestants are seeing very unProtestant like <laughs> presence in the images. And I was thinking about books as well, because even before your period, John Wesley was yeah. using the Bible to do divination when he was deciding whether he wanted to get married or not. He'd open it up and pick a verse, and that would tell him. And then you had these uh, accounts of Civil War soldiers who were miraculously saved because the bullet lodged in their Bible. Right. So did your missionaries, were they self-reflective enough to say, when they see these practices, maybe we aren't so different? Well, I think there isn't a sense of, you know, they'll tell the stories, like they'll say, look at these kinds of wacky stories, but then they'll very unselfconsciously say, I wrapped up this book and I brought it here, you know, and so, and also too, even this image of Judson holding up the last leaf of the Bible, you know, there was this fetishization of making this translation and getting the printing, you know, all of this stuff, and so I think this kind of, idea that we Protestants are, you know, don't have any kind of religious materiality is just a kind of sort of later historiographic confusion as, as Morgan, you know, as David Morgan's work and other people's show and that for them their big thing was depicting God. So that was the one thing. Like, we don't find these Jesus images until later and for during the 19th century missionary period there was this concern that there, this argument that, that you know, we're not, we're not going to do what the Buddhists are doing with their big Buddha statues. Like, we can't do that. And even though they were like, they would say, one of the biggest problems we're having is that we don't have images of God. And people would say, show us your God. And they'd be like, yeah, about that. We can't do that, you know? <laughs> so they had that line. But I think some of this other stuff, you know, in terms of that there were, that were, there were important objects, I don't know that they were as conscious or thinking that this was against some sort of, you know, Protestant argument. But then you do have stories where they will talk about the local Catholic priest, you know, up the street who's got secret images of the Virgin saints, Mary. yeah, like hiding in his, his <laughs> you know, cloth. So, you know, it, it is interesting to try and track that. What is their, what is their real concern? Except, and I think one of their biggest concerns was that was their biggest argument, you know. They went there like, listen guys, we're going to tell you that your idols are powerless. That's our, they're idolaters, you know. And then once they got there and realized there was so much else going on, this whole sort of rhetoric of idolatry seemed to be something that was really important more for the letters back home and the people, you know, I think in the end. Because then they're collecting these Buddha statues, you know, they're taking them home with them, you know, and so it's... it's that was my, my other question. Yeah. There's this great irony that they're criticizing these locals for worshiping business cards and they don't know what they're doing with our objects. But you said in the archives they're packed full of all of this stuff they brought back from Burma. Did they know what they were collecting? Were they, was there kind of a parallel there? I think that they did know, some of them did know what they were collecting. Mala beads were really popular because I think they were just sort of light and easy to send. So they would say these are sort of rosaries and so on. The manuscripts, though, I don't know that they always knew what they were collecting because especially like with these Kamawa, I mean, I think they knew that they were sort of ritual texts, but they didn't always know what they said. And they didn't spend like the one that Josiah and Nelson Cushing sent to Brown University in 1881. Um, oh, it's back here. He just brought them all back, and then Henry Clark Warren, who did his Buddhism and translation, ended up pouring over and reading those documents. And so he didn't know what he had, but he, he just sort of wanted to collect stuff, kind of touristy. Um, sometimes they would say, oh, I have, this is a mala, or this is a rosary, they would call it, that... Um, that someone gave me after they converted. So it was kind of like a trophy, you know? But I don't know, that wasn't so common. A lot of times they're just like, did you get the, 
you know, little Buddha statue I sent. And even I think, I tried to track this down, but one of the very first Buddha statues, I think, that I found record of in the, a museum in Hartford, Connecticut, was donated by this guy, Francis Mason, a white marble Buddha that came from Bagan, but I haven't been able to track it down or find any evidence of it. Some Perry Davis vegetable paint. I know. Fascinated by that. <laughs> I know. Uh, the question it raises: What else did they give them as part of their missionary mm -hmm. work? Well, it's interesting because the story that she has about about this Buddhist monk who ended up giving her this land. She said that the, one of the first times she met him, she had smelling salts that she gave him to. She had these like little smelling salts, which I understand are kind of these rock like things that they would hold, that they would use, I guess, if you faint a lot, but there's no records of her having a fainting problem. So you wonder, why was she giving these smelling salts? And she showed them to him, and he smelled and was really impressed. And you wonder if it's some of these, there's this tradition in Burma where people have these kind of magical stones, you know, the sort of, sort of like, this other practices, sort of occult practices that we read about in our class, you know? So the idea that, that maybe she was really like, you know, using this to play into people's ideas that maybe she was kind of this occult priestess, or I don't know if occult is like, old-fashioned word, but just that she was someone with special powers, you know. She had tapas or something, I don't know. Look, there aren't any more burning questions. We can let our speaker go, but um, not before we thank her one more time for her presentation. Thank you, guys. <laughs>